Mr. Moderator, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Firstly, I would like to say how honoured I feel that I'm given a second chance to speak to the Oxford Union, this very well-known union which has produced several British Prime Ministers. Uh, well, I'm not uh, going to be a Prime Minister of the UK, but uh, I was twice Prime Minister in Malaysia. But in any case, I was told that I can talk about anything. Well, there are lots of things I would like to talk about, but I don't think I would have enough time to talk about the things that I like to talk about. So I will then leave it to you to ask questions afterwards. But in the meantime, I would like to point out that we live in troubled times. There are so many things happening that, uh, that are bad for the whole world. First, we have the climate change, and the climate change can result in a lot of disasters for people. And we, at the moment, we have not found ways how to deal with this climate change. Then, of course, there is this pandemic my COVID-19, uh, and that too is not very well handled by us. Uh, there was a story by H.G. Wells, I think, about uh, how the world was attacked by creatures from other planets and how the creatures were defeated. But today we are actually, we are actually attacked by creatures not from other planets, but from our own planet. Tiny creatures that we could hardly see, but it has wrought terrible damage to the whole world. The whole world is affected, but we are not uh, behaving like the whole world. Uh, each country is taking its own uh, steps to protect itself, and uh, of course the rich countries uh, have uh, monopolized uh, the uh, provision of uh, vaccine, for example. After that, we now seem to go back to our old ways of killing each other. We now have a war between Russia and Ukraine basically not just the Ukraine, but also NATO. So we are again resorting to killing people in order to resolve conflicts between us. I have always been against war. I think it is uncivilized. To kill people in order to solve conflicts is something that civilized people should not indulge in. But apparently, we are addicted to that. Any time at all we have problems, we go to war and we kill people. At the end of it all, whether you win or you lose, you gain nothing. You solve nothing. That was the result that you get after the Second World War. In the Second World War, we did the alliance, Western Alliance defeated Germany. But uh, after the war, Germany and also Japan did very well. The winners didn't do so well. Instead, the, win the winners decided to, uh, well, to fight each other. You partners partnered Russia during the war in order to defeat Germany. But immediately after the war was over, was won by the West, uh, you decide that the next enemy would be Russia. And so for years, for decades, there was a Cold War between the West and Russia. Uh, that Cold War did not result in a real war, but the tension remained, and today we see the result of that Cold War is a, 
a war between Russia and the Western powers. So it seems to, to me that uh, we always like to have some enemies so that we can fight with them, so that we can kill them. That is not a very civilized thing to do. Imagine in any society where the solution to any problem you may have with your neighbor is to kill him. That would not be very, uh, well, it would not contribute to stability, certainly. And yet, in between the, as between nations, whenever they have problem, they resort to fighting and killing each other. I don't know when we are going to get over this habit of killing people in order to solve uh, our conflicts between nations. It will not be in my lifetime, certainly, but I do hope that uh, young people will grow up to reject war as a means of uh, solving problems or conflicts within nations. But in the meantime, we are going to go through a climate change. The main result of the climate change is uh, growing warmth, growing the climate getting hotter and hotter. When the climate gets hotter, what happens is that the ice will melt, raising the level of the seas, there will be evaporation, there will be a formation of clouds, strong winds, and then there will be storms, severe storms, and the storms will result in terrible, uh, heavy, very heavy rain, which will flood countries. We should be focusing on that, but we are not. We are more interested in the East and the West. We still think that uh, the problem that we should spend our time on is to deal with enemies. And now that we have uh, the West regarding uh, Russia, China, and Iran as the enemy, and tons of money are spent inventing new weapons in order to, be, to kill people more efficiently. I don't think that is a good thing. We could spend that money, trillions of dollars, on dealing with the uh, climate change, on dealing with the pandemic, but not on killing people. But um, the fact remains that we spend more time inventing new weapons, spending a lot of money on new weapons uh, that can kill people more people than we have been able uh, to do in the past. So that is the world that we live in. Uh, for people who are going to grow into the old in this world, I hope that you don't uh, emulate uh, the, the ways of your predecessors or your, the older people. I think young people should think more about how to be peaceful and to tackle the real problems of this world. But uh, apparently, we are not focused on that. We acquire knowledge in the schools and universities, but uh, we are not taught how to make use of the knowledge. We can always abuse the knowledge that we gain. I have always pointed out that um, a knife is a useful thing. You can use a knife to carve beautiful things, but you can also use a knife to kill other people. It depends on you whether that instrument is good or bad. It's not the instrument. As the American says, the Americans say the guns are not a fault, it's the people who use the guns. But obviously, if the people don't have the guns, they cannot shoot 21 children in a school. But uh, the argument is that 
guns do not kill. It's the people who kill. Well, that may be true or may not be true, but I think it is time that we rethink the value systems that we follow, that we consider to be universal values. We need to change our minds about things. Above all, we need to change our man minds about this globe, this planet, which has become very small, and we are neighbors, close neighbors of each other. And close neighbors tend to, well, have conflicts and quarrel, but we should learn that quarrels should not be solved through killing each other, but should be solved through discussion, negotiations at the table, arbitration, or going to a court of law. Uh, I would like to point out that in Malaysia, we have problems with our neighbours, with Indonesia, with, the, with Singapore. Uh, well, we decided to go to the courts, the international court, and the court decided that one rock belonged to Singapore and not to us. That's okay, it's only a rock. But two islands belong to Malaysia instead of Indonesia. But there's no war. There's no war, no damage, no killing. But uh, like civilized people, we have the rule of law and we obey the rule of law by going to the courts to settle our problems. I hope that uh, some lessons may be deprived, derived from this experience of Malaysia, that despite being a multiracial country, Malaysia is relatively stable and peaceful, able to develop, and when we have problems with our neighbours, we resolve those problems through negotiation, arbitration, or going to a court of law, so that we don't do damage to each other, we don't kill each other, and yet we solve the problems that arose because of overlapping claims of territories. I'm told that I should speak for about 10 minutes. I think my 10 minutes are up, and uh, I need to answer a question from the moderator as well as from the, the audience, and uh, I hope I can answer those questions. Thank you. Please join me um, seated here. Thank oh. you. I've also poured you some water. Thank you very much for that opening speech and thank you indeed for coming to visit us today. I just thought I should start by one of the important things of, that you mentioned in your opening speech, something that matters a lot to um, the whole world right now. And that of course is climate change, which, is, which is, you spoke about. Um, climate change is expected to have considerable impact in Malaysia, sadly. And I wondered what your thoughts was on what countries that are on the coastal regions like Malaysia should be doing right now. What should Malaysia be doing right now? We have tried to promote the idea that war is a crime. Unfortunately, not very many people agreed with us, so they are still fighting wars. Besides that, I think government should focus not too much on politics, but more on growing the country developing the country. That is what uh, we did in Malaysia. And although we were an ag agricultural country, uh, we were able to convert our country to an industrial manufacturing in that kind of country. And with that, uh, the country grew very well and the people had a, a better life. Unfortunately, politics uh, got in the way. We changed government 
we unfortunately found a leader who's not interested in growing the country, but is interested more in making money for himself. That's sad. In terms of uh, climate change and the, the interest with regards to preserving the planet, um, who do you think is, should be taking action in leading that force? Should it be coastal countries like Malaysia or what collaboratory, what team of people can work together to combat climate change? Where do people work? How do you think Malaysia and the world can work to combat climate change? Yeah, there was a good idea after or whatever, during the last Great War, the Second Great War, that we should have an international body which would uh, help resolve uh, conflicts and problems so that there will not be any wars. So they set up the United Nations. Unfortunately, the five uh, countries which won the war decided that they should have extra powers, veto powers. Uh, if there is anything that any one of them do not like, then they should veto that, that thing. So because of that, the, the United Nations is not a democratic uh, organization. And when we bring problems to the United Nations, uh, the, uh, the five powers frustrate us by vetoing anything that they don't like. So that is why this attempt to uh, find a solution to uh, the conflicts between nations has failed. Uh, what we need to do is, of course, I, to have reforms in the United Nations uh, by removing the veto powers or to modify the veto powers so that the United Nations have become more effective. At the moment, it is not effective. Yeah, definitely. I, I think that's quite evident as well in what we're seeing in the world today. Another thing you mentioned in your opening um, um, summit was about Ukraine and the wars that's going on, and that's also prevalent in your responses so far, how we need to move on to a world that has much more peace and less conflict. Um, we are currently seeing the war in Ukraine. In 2014, uh, Russia-Ukraine crisis occurred. Uh, Malaysia Air Flight, Flight MH17, uh, was traveling from Amsterdam to Kalua Lumpur and was shot down by a Russian-made missile. Given that, what role do you think Russia, sorry, I mean Malaysia can play in the current um, conflict in Ukraine? Well, this is an incident that uh, has happened to a Malaysian plane. Uh, we lost the plane, we lost the passengers. But one has to remember that uh, an Iranian plane flying in, in the Gulf was shot down by an American uh, warship. Uh, it couldn't be that the ship they did not recognize that it was a passenger plane. I think it was a deliberate uh, attack against um, passengers, civilians. So both sides are carrying out things that are destructive and not benefiting to anyone. If you can blame the Russian for shooting down the Malaysian plane, we should also blame the Americans for shooting down the Iranian plane. And all these people should be put to trial in a court of law so that those responsible will be punished. But at the moment, we see that the people who shot down the Malaysian plane has been tried in a court of law in Holland, I think. And, but nothing has been said about this American warship which shot down an Iranian plane. So when we talk about justice, justice must apply equally to everyone, not just to our enemies, but not our friends. That is not justice. That's amazing. Um, one last question on the 
uh, theme of conflicts and how to resolve them. Uh, what lessons do you think neighbouring countries in active conflict zones can take away from the Malaysian, Indonesian approach to resolving conflict? Yeah, well, uh, we are neighbours. Malaysians and Indonesians are practically the same people, excepting that they were colonised by the Dutch, we were colonised by the British, and therefore we uh, consider that we should be uh, independent of Indonesia. Of course, initially there was a lot of uh, unhappiness on the part of Indonesia because Malaysia expanded by acquiring two states, two states in the island of Borneo. And there was a confrontation declared by the president of Indonesia. Uh, it went on for some time. There was even some uh, military action taken. But uh, later on, the leader in Indonesia was displaced and a new leader took over and the decision, decision was made by them that they should not have this conflict with Malaysia because we are practically the same people. And so the leadership of in Malaysia and Indonesia uh, decided to negotiate and as a result the confrontation was ended and Malaysia and Indonesia have become friends, that we are supportive of each other. This is uh, not unique. Uh, you see that in the last war, for example, although the conflict uh, was between uh, Germany and France, but today they are friends. They have uh, disregarded the past atrocities committed by either side. As the same thing has happened between Japan and America. They were very strong enemies before. A lot of uh, killings, uh, atrocities were committed. But they decided that uh, there is no benefit in fighting each other. There's a lot to be gained by having friendly relations. And so Japan and America today are good friends. Uh, I should hope that uh, other people should take this as a, as a model, that uh, conflicts between enemies can end up with being friends again. You can find areas where you see things uh, in the same way, and then you end your confrontation and establish friendship with each other. That's very encouraging and inspiring. I, I thought we should take a a, a, a time to go back in time and, and think about what inspired you to go into politics, given that you started off in the medical field as a physician. Um, could you tell us more about that time and, and, and why you decided to embark on a political career? Uh, I didn't catch you. Yes, I just thought we should go back in time from when yeah. you were younger, uh, before politics. Uh, what inspired you to get into politics especially when you had a medical background? And we have a... As a physician. Yeah. If we will go back in time, we'll, we'll see that there were times when we were enemies, and then for certain reasons, uh, we decide that we should be friends. And I think for other times also in the future, we should be friends. Being enemies is destructive. War is very destructive. France and Germany, Britain and Germany were enemies before, but they are not enemies now. They have come to their senses that fighting each other does not uh, give any benefit to either the winner or the loser. So this kind of thinking should prevail whenever there are conflicts and we should resolve conflicts through peaceful means, not through killing each other. Yes, I definitely, definitely agree. Uh, since your time um, going through politics, uh, the last time you won an election was 2018. I wanted to go back to that time as well. Recalling the winning of that election, what was the most significant moments that you remembered? 
We need the election. To win in the 2018 election, yes. <laughs> well, uh, I really didn't expect to win in the first place. But uh, apparently, people were not happy with the previous government. And uh, they decided that there should be a change. And we benefit, benefited from their perception of things. So it, it is uh, necessary, of course, when you are contesting, that you point out the bad things about your opponents and the good things about yourself. You see, but both are equally bad. And of course, since you've left office, you've had the chance to reflect back on the country and how much has flourished. Uh, what would you say is missing from Malaysian politics at the moment? Yeah, Malaysian politics has de deteriorated because um, we thought of uh, a good system, democracy for example. But democracy in the hands of bad people can become very bad. Uh, the people think not so much as serving the people, serving the country, but uh, they gain financially by being elected. So they were looking at how much money they can make uh, when they form the government and how much money they, they can steal when they become the government. So this has influenced some Malaysian politics so that now many politicians are not interested in serving the country, but rather in the gains that he could make when he gets elected. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very true. And I think that under your leadership, um, Malaysia, on one hand, transformed into an Asian economic powerhouse and, 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 and one of the Asian economic tigers. Um, but on the other hand, some people uh, uh, criticized saying that your authoritarian approach um, did not quite fit the democratic mm -hmm. mandate. Um, would you, how would you respond to those people? Well, if you're in the opposition and you want to displace the leader, the, the man who is in power, you have to dem demonize him. You have to call him a dictator and all kinds of nasty things. So when I was a prime minister, I was called a dictator, that I was corrupt, etc., etc. That is normal. Uh, I accepted that, okay, you can say that, but prove it. And they couldn't prove anything. I didn't take any money. But one has to be uh, determined and uh, disciplined and sometimes to be uh, uh, very harsh, perhaps, if one, you want to do something. Anything that you want to do in the government, there will be opposition. If you go according to what the opposition says, you will do nothing. So we have to ignore what the opposition says and carry on with what you want, you want to do. And uh, it, during my time, this is what I did. You see, they said, uh, uh, it's a waste of money building this bridge between the island of Penang and the mainland. So I thought it was a good thing. We built a bridge and then uh, they found that the bridge was useful and these people who condemned the bridge now wants to have two other bridges. So it is not so much that what you want to do is bad, but because they don't like you, they call you by, by a lot of uh, nasty names. Uh, you have to accept it. Yeah. I hope we talk about more about that in a minute. Um, but earlier on, you mentioned how democracy in the hands of bad people is not good, which um, is probably something that many people would agree with. Uh, the recent times across the world, we have seen the rise of populism. And I wonder how you see the future of democracy uh, in this world where we're having many, many populists rise. Yeah. Democracy is perhaps the best uh, system ever invented by men. But democracy is open to abuses. For example, uh, you say that uh, 
the, the, people, the party with the majority should form the government. That's okay. And how do you find out whether he has the majority support or not? You have elections. But during elections, you have people paying, uh, bribing people to vote for them. So they win. That means that democracy has not delivered on its promise. If everybody is, uh, is fair and avoids bribery and elects the, the government, then I think the government is uh, quite legitimate, quite democratic. But when you have parties with a lot of money and they buy votes, that means that democracy is open to abuses. And when it is open to abuses, of course, it doesn't deliver. So democracy doesn't, doesn't deliver the right kind of government always. Uh, some governments, uh, after they have uh, been elected, they also may abuse their power, steal government money, misuse government authority, etc. So democracy may, may uh, enable you to f elect a government, but the government you have elected can also abuse their authority and democracy fails to deliver the kind of good government that you want to see. Hmm. Thank you. Um, Malaysia is one of the major investment hub of China's Belt and Road Initiative. You used to be a vocal critic uh, after renegotiating on the cost of the East Coast Rail Link. You became the biggest supporter of the Belt and Road Initiative. Could you tell us more about what changed your mind and why? No, my mind has not been changed. I still welcome uh, foreign private investment. It's a good way of growing the country, especially when you are poor, you don't have the technology, you don't have the know-how. Uh, it's good to invite uh, foreign investment, also lo local investment. But um, largely, if you have foreign investment, uh, you lose a lot of money because to induce them to come and invest, you have to give them uh, tax-free uh, uh, exemption. Uh, when they have tax-free, they don't pay tax, of course you lose money. So that is the bad side of uh, investment. But on the other hand, if there is no investment, there will be no jobs, and the country will never grow, will never become rich. So there is a choice that you have to make. And in the case of Malaysia, in the initial stages, we need to have investment, both foreign and local. And for that, uh, we were able to extend to them certain privileges, like tax free period. But after some time, we find that uh, they, are, they are not creating the jobs that we want them to create. Uh, the, the jobs created by them is of a very low level and the country doesn't benefit much from their investment. Then we have to think of other ways of um, growing the country. And one of the ways is for us to go into some industries which we can dominate. And in the case of Malaysia, we decided that we should produce gloves. And it so happens that gloves were much needed because of the pandemic. Now Malaysia produces the most number of gloves in the world. We, we produce about 40% of the gloves in the world and uh, Malaysia has benefited. But of course, it's not just gloves. We have a lot of things that we produce now which does not depend upon foreign investment, but depend on local investment. So the, the, when we find that the uh, contract given to build the railway, for example, uh, is one-sided, doesn't benefit Malaysia, we renegotiate. It's not that we reject the uh, investment. We renegotiate in order to have better terms. Of course, and uh, you were voted into office, especially on the mandate 
of gets in the country out of suffocating debt, roughly $250 uh, billion of it. Um, some of it owed to Chinese companies. Do you think that you know, the work you've done has fulfilled that pledge of getting um, the country out of the debt that you have voted on as, um, as a democratic mandate? But I didn't get what you... No, apologies. So you voted into office with a mandate uh, that included getting the country out of debt, uh, around $250 billion of it. You just talked right now about the investments that the country has benefited under uh, your regime. I was just asking further, do you think you've fulfilled the promise of getting Malaysia out of debt as promised? Well, when we do anything at all, we need to go into the details uh, and find out where, whether really it is beneficial or not. If you find that it is not beneficial, of course you can terminate the whole uh, idea, the whole project. But you can also renegotiate. It is better to renegotiate. That is Malaysia's approach. That if we find something that is not favorable for Malaysia, we renegotiate. It's not that we uh, discard the whole thing completely. Thank you. Um, one more question related to uh, the idea of economics. Um, one thing that critics have said about the Belt and Road Initiative is that it might actually be a form of debt trap. Um, and you yourself called it a new form of colonialism. Do you think that critics have a point still? Or do you think that view, or do you change your view on that? Well, it all depends on the, with the study of the detail. Uh, there are some good things. In, in almost any, any thing that we do, uh, the result can be quite good, but there may be some negative uh, results also. By studying very closely, we will be able to decide whether the benefit is more than the, the uh, losses that we have to sustain. So it's not a case of uh, outright rejection of things. It is always based on um, a proper study of uh, whatever it is that we are doing so that uh, we will benefit from uh, what is being done. Thank you. One last question before I open up to um, the audience. Um, you hosted um, recently, I mean in the past, a summit of the major uh, Muslim countries and said that the Muslim world is in a state of crisis. I wanted to ask what future do you see now for the Muslim world? You see now what? What future you see for the Muslim world? Which one is that? So you hosted a summit in, in the past and said that the Which Muslim is world that? is in a state of crisis. I wondered uh, what future you see now for the Muslim world. Well, it's difficult to foretell what will happen later on, but we have some idea. But what is important is that along the way, whenever we are doing something, if you see something wrong, you must be prepared to take corrective action. Uh, never be uh, uh, so uh, well attached to an idea that even though we get good, bad results, we continue with it. So in many cases, uh, we, we have to change the direction even in order to ensure that we get the biggest benefit possible. Thank you. I would like to open the floor for audience questions. Um, please wait till the microphone is handed to you and if you could stand up um, so that the camera can get a full glimpse of you, um, that would be really helpful. Uh, for the first question, I recognise the lady on the third row at the edge of this uh, front here. Hi, good evening. Thank you so much for the talk. So um, I have three questions, if that's okay, we've got some time, but if not, I can just... If you can try with the first one, then we can okay. continue. Um, 
So my first question is, ASEAN is known to have like the principle of non-interference between the ASEAN countries and it's been critiqued that this causes more conflicts between the ASEAN countries and I was just wondering what your opinion is on to what extent should countries intervene in each other's conflicts in order to preserve peace and in your opinion is ASEAN ready for that? Um, should I proceed with my other questions? Or? So the question was, uh, to what extent should other countries intervene in other countries for the sake of peace? To what extent? Yeah, to what extent should another country intervene in the affairs of another country in order to create peace? Well, uh, relations with countries is always uh, tricky. Uh, and there will be cases where we'll have differences. But the main thing about uh, relationship with another country is through negotiation, through sitting down around the table and discussing. So uh, we, we, have, um, we have a problem with Singapore, for example. And uh, we have not gone to war with Singapore. We have uh, decided that we should try and resolve it through discussion. So we, we, uh, we are not uh, strong enough to impose our will on our neighbours, for example. So it is far better that we take a very uh, reasonable stand on whatever difference that we may have with whichever country. Thank you. Um, I would like to maybe recognize another, another question and maybe come back to you if we have time. Uh, the gentleman with the brown jacket on the second row there. Hi, Tun. Um, my question is, uh, so the NEP or race-based politics uh, or policies in Malaysia was introduced to lessen the gap between different races. Um, but now we find instances of a lot of abuse by rich Malays abusing uh, these race-based policies. So do you not think it is time to move towards needs-based policies, targeting the poor across all races? And if true that it's majority of the Malays that are poor, they would still stand to benefit at the same time, and the rich Malays are then not able to abuse uh, racial-based policies then. So do you think it's time to move towards needs-based policies as opposed to racial-based policies? Thank you. Well, uh, when you talk about need, you think that what you think is the need is the same as what other people think is the need. There are differences. You may think that uh, what you consider to be a need of some people may not be the same as what other people think. That is one thing. What is happening is that uh, there are differences based on wealth, for example. Some people are rich and some people are poor. There is an idea that, uh, well, we forget about race. We just help the poor. Unfortunately, the result is not the same. Some poor people benefit from whatever uh, opportunities they are given, but some other poor people cannot benefit because for, for other reasons, perhaps because of their culture. So we need to recognize the fact that certain races, given the same chance, do not do as well as other races. That is the story of humanity. Why do you think some countries are doing well and some countries are not doing well. Of course, you can help the needy, but if the needy doesn't know how to make use of the opportunities, they are not going to do well. On the other hand, there may be needy people in other countries, but they have the capacity to do well, and they will do well. That is something that you need to recognize. As between, for example, uh, uh, the, the Japanese, for example, they were very badly beaten during the war, but they had the capacity to recover. Their culture allowed them to recover. But some people who were 
damage during the war could not recover. So you see that the Japan has done better than most other countries which also won the war, but their capacity to improve themselves is weaker than that of Japan. So we would like to say that let's forget about race. Let's just concentrate on poverty. The result will not be the same. I have watched this over 80 years. When, the, when Malaysia received a lot of uh, people from other countries to live in Malaysia and work in Malaysia, these people were all poor, as poor as the Malaysians. But the Malaysians, the Malays in particular, did not do so well because they don't have the culture that enables them to make good progress. The other people who have a culture that is uh, more positive, they have done well. So the disparity has become worse. Not, it's not by just attending to poverty, it doesn't result in solving the problem between races. That is why we have to have this um, uh, affirmative action, because affirmative action directs at the poor people of this particular race. Thank you. I recognise the member with the black jacket. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks so much, Tun. Uh, thanks for being here today. I have uh, questions regarding brain drain and a lot of the uh, underlying challenges in Malaysia. So we all know that brain drain is a long-standing issue that we face in Malaysia, and this problem is only getting worse recently, and statistics have found that at least half a million of highly skilled Malaysians are working in professional industry overseas. So the problem is that many of these Malaysians from uh, research has found that the reason why they choose to work overseas is because uh, mainly for one reason, skepticism about the country's prospect. And this comes from different uh, you know, uh, underlying factors. For example, like uh, pointed out earlier, policies that meant well but poorly executed, but also poor leadership where uh, people were given positions in government as well as uh, GLC, not based on their merit, but based on some other external factors. So if you were to be elected as a prime minister again, uh, what would you do to address these challenges or why are these challenges was not fully addressed during your tenure? Thanks so much. Well, uh, what you're saying is almost the same as what he has said. Uh, that uh, we are not fair. We discriminate in Malaysia. We help the Malays more than the Chinese. But the strange thing is that while we help the Malays more than the Chinese, the Malays remain poor and the Chinese who have not been helped are much better off. It's because of the difference in their culture. For example, I don't know how many Malays are in Oxford University as compared to Chinese. Although you are not helped, you are here. You have the opportunity because probably because you are better off than the Malays. So helping people does not produce the same result irrespective of the kind of people that you help. So that has to be taken into consideration. And of course, uh, the people who do not get will feel that it is unfair. But the people who do not get, there are people who feel that um, they have not been given the chance. So they will feel very unhappy about it. We are living in a multiracial, multi-religious country. It's very difficult to balance the development of the different races. Some races do better than others. That is a fact of life. And if you were to say that being equal to everybody would produce equal result, I would say that you are wrong. You can be equal to everybody, but some people will do better 
than others. This is why in examinations, for example, in your school, you have to sit for the same paper, you have been taught by the same teacher, you have given the time, same time as others, but some people do better than other, some students do better than other students. It's a question of capacity. So we have to try to balance it through giving better chance, better opportunities to those whom we think would not do so well. So this is something that we have to accept. Thank you. Um, I recognize the speaker with the, oh, well, with the UNIF jumper. Hi, Tun. Um, so you were in power for 22 years and then another two years after that. Um, I would just, and you are one of the main implementers of the new economic policy. Um, I would just like to ask, given that you see these disparities between the races exist today, under the implementation of the new economic policy, is there anything else uh, that you would do uh, in order to close the differences between the races that aren't based on affirmative action, given that the strategy that um, has been implemented by yourself and your parties has, may have closed the gap but not entirely eliminated the gap? <clears throat> well, I should think that um, I have some ideas about how to overcome the uh, weakness of certain people. Uh, I, I mentioned just now about the rule of culture, the rule of value system. Uh, for example, we create opportunities for the Malays and for the Chinese. Uh, we give a contract to a Malay. He doesn't know what to do with the contract. He's not a good uh, contractor. He sells the contract. Obviously, he's not going to get very well, get uh, better well. But when he sells to the Chinese, the Chinese is much better in business. In fact, they are so good that even the Americans are worried about them. So what happens is that although under the new economic policy, we favor the Malays, but actually the, the results are is quite different from what we expected. The Malays do not do well because they find a shortcut, the quick way to become uh, uh, rich by selling whatever opportunities they get. But the Chinese, they are very industrious, very clever in business, and they do well from the new economic policy. In fact, the new economic policy has actually uh, broaden the disparity between the Malays and Chinese. Now we know why. Because the Malays were selling the opportunities given to them. This time around, if they were given contracts and they sell, then the contract becomes null and void. So you cannot sell. So whether they like it or not, they have to do it by themselves. Of course, they will make mistakes. They will lose some, but some will succeed. Um, the speaker on the second row with a black top. Yep. Hi, hello. Um, my question was about corruption. Um, basically, uh, we all know that like tackling corruption in government is no easy task. And especially in the literature that we study here, a lot of Western academics really emphasize, sorry, really emphasize the importance of a free press in battling cor corruption, which I don't feel personally is as uh, warranted as we see in this world. I just wanted to ask, in your opinion and experience, what do you think are the main uh, like factors that might be crucial in preventing corruption within a government? Thank you. Thank you. So what are the main factors that will be very, very crucial in preventing corruption? 
Well, uh, corruption is found everywhere. Rich countries, poor countries, there will be corruption. But some countries are less corrupt than other countries, other people. The thing is that uh, it is, uh, as I said just now, your value system. Do you feel that it is right or do you feel it is wrong? If you feel that corruption is okay, then of course that will be uh, something that you find in the society all the time. But if you think that you are doing something wrong, then you will don't do it. That is why if you want to eradicate or reduce corruption, you have to begin when they were very young. You know, we were brought up by our, our parents uh, to respect certain things, to believe in certain things, that certain things are good, certain things are bad, that um, stealing is wrong and you should not steal, and corruption is again wrong, as wrong as stealing is. So if you are taught that when you are young, when you grow old, you are less inclined to commit any act that will be considered as corruption. But in, when a society like Malaysia, you have a leader, a leader, the top man, the prime minister is corrupt, then normally uh, the followers, the other people will also be corrupt. Yes, Malaysia was corrupt. During my time, uh, there was corruption. But it wasn't so bad that things cannot be done. But when this, uh, the sixth prime minister took over, he declared that cash is king. In other words, to win support, you must bribe people. And of course, now the whole country has become corrupt. The whole party that he leads is corrupt. So to to overcome corruption, you must have a good leader who is not corrupt. That is one of the most important things. And the other side of it, of course, is that when you are young, while in school, for example, you are taught that corruption is a crime that you must not commit. For the very religious people, you must teach them that it is a sin, that you will go to hell if you are corrupt. So these are value system. And if you have the correct values, then you can reduce corruption. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sadly, we've now hit the hour mark and that's all we have time for. Um, apologies for those who could not have the questions asked. Um, it's been a great pleasure having you here today, Dr. Mahathir. I'd like you all to join me in thanking him for coming.